All right. Hello. Welcome, Welcome Lisa and Richie, to the so solution raising. I have so many names for things on transportation. And we didn't yet discuss before we went live. Um, I'm going to leave it open as just transportation in general, because it could be goods or it could be people. So for the first 15 minutes, we will be talking about what we currently do for transportation, both ourselves and the world, right? What we think is good about it, what we think is bad about it. And the reason we only give 15 minutes is this is generally what we concentrate on mostly in society. So we're just kind of rehashing things that we've probably talked about a lot or thought about a lot, even if you haven't necessarily thought about transportation in general. So whoever would like to start can share some thoughts on what you currently do for transportation. Well, do you need, we need a certain amount of courage, those of us who are unprepared. <laughs> Fair enough, then I can always start. <laughs> well, if you want to start, that's fine. If you want uh, a fool to jump in where angels fear to tread, I'm willing to be the fool. All right, <laughs> let's, let's do that. I would love to hear your thoughts, Lisa. Okay, well, I've been um, working with uh, disaster recovery. I live in Northern California, and as you may know, we've had a number of fires, which I guess, Richie, you had in Australia as well. Hmm. And one of the big um, transportation problems that we've had has been transportation of goods, especially goods which volunteers want to give to disaster victims, disaster survivors. Victims is not politically correct. Um, but um, we've had a tremendous outpouring from private individuals who want to clean their closets, and some of them want to give away their rags, but others want to give away really valuable clothing to people that have been wiped out. Um, so there's clothing, there's furniture, there's household supplies, there's consumables, there's food. Um, and often these are coming from out of the area. Actually, we got a shipment of, I've forgotten where the zero goes, either 10,000 or 100,000 tulip bulbs that were sent to the campfire in Northern California to replant after the fire, which was a wonderful um, contribution. But it's the, it's, it's the transportation when things are going from one person to another that was a real problem. Um, and it seemed to me, and, and this is a sort of unvetted un, uh, opinion, um, that what happened was the, the agencies that were trying to organize relief for the people impacted by the disasters, negatively impacted, um, was that they felt like they had to be the, the storage depot for all the donations. So transportation was put first, uh, which meant, well, first was somebody said, I, I want to give uh, a closet full of, of little children's clothes, uh, but I can't get them there. So you have to arrange for transportation but, but along with transportation is inventory or storage, um, which is the, the, the one end of transportation. And um, it seemed like uh, a lot of the agencies that wanted to be helping agencies didn't understand the logistics of just-in-time delivery. And so I was advocating rather than put transportation the goods are, made, are, are available at one source, then immediately you want to transport, transport them, then you have to warehouse them, then you have to distribute them, was to do a much more just-in-time kind of um, process where what the, the agencies did was they handled putting the donor and the recipient together so that they could make their own arrangements for how the, the goods got um, transported. And it might be that you needed a third donor who would be someone who would donate the transportation, whether they would donate the funds for, sh for commercial shipping or whether they would put a dining room full of furniture in their pickup and drive it to the recipient. Um, I just think we could do with local transportation, we could do a lot more with volunteer, with donation, um, with um, doing not doing mass transportation of the goods but doing individual transportation um, and not necessarily using commercial shipping. So that's just one idea to throw out and I don't know if it's on topic or not. Yes, I think it is. 
perfectly on topic for the uh, transportation. You guys can hear me, right? I just switched to the different, so I could, there's a weird buzz in the room. <laughs> I don't want to hear. So Richie, do you want to share or do you want me to share? Yeah, sure, sure. Um, yeah, so I mean, the transportation that I use is um, mainly buses and trains at the moment. I, I used to have a car uh, when I was living in New Zealand, but I, I got rid of my car. And yeah, I'm sort of just organizing my life around um, public transport for the meantime. Um, partly financially and partly just because, you know, having a, having a car is a pain in the ass. Um, but, I mean, the, the system works pretty well here locally in Melbourne, um, like having your transportation connected with um, Google Maps. It's just fantastic, really easy to um, get around. I mean, buses are late and early every so often, but it's generally a pretty reliable system, um, especially given how huge the city is. Um, but, yeah, what, what was the other part of the question? It's just what you're currently doing for transportation or like Lisa talked about transportation of goods, what this, what's currently happening in the world and what's good and bad about it. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. So my personal trans, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. My, my personal transportation is uh, pretty effective um, for the uses that I have, but I sort of designed myself around the systems that are already there. And I think they're pretty good. Um, I think traffic's probably, quite a nightmare so you know it would it'd be good to see in the future uh, less cars on the road more you know ride sharing more those sorts of um being able to just nobody owns a car and just you know you just hire it out when you need it that kind of thing but i, I don't know if, if we can sort of figure out those systems um and then the wider transportation system i'm not, not very familiar with Thanks, Richie. Um, transportation is something I've given some thought to, but it's not definitely one of my areas of expertise. But I personally have a, a vehicle. In Vancouver, we have amazing public transit. The public transit doesn't work for me, doesn't work with having a kid and getting from door to door, not with my disability. So because I don't have enough money to drive an electric car, I end up buying like a $5,000 car. It ends up lasting about five years and to run it into the ground and then get a new one. And it's, it's doesn't feel good as an environmentalist to, to be doing it that way, but it seems to be what's effective for my life. Um, I take a plane every four or five years to go visit family. I actually am visiting family right now amidst the coronavirus and possibly going back to Vancouver early, but the, the, cost as well as of course the environmental cost of, of plane travel is not sustainable and the i know with the transportation of goods it seems ridiculous that we um so like mine take the raw resources from one country ship them to somewhere to get to get manufactured ship them somewhere else to get used and ship them back to get recycled or disposed of and a lot of times it just makes no sense it's like traveling back and forth across the globe several times and we're not making stuff to last, which is not this conversation, we're talking about transportation, but that that is all in embedded in the good, that it, it's not designed to last and it's designed to be shipped all over the world. So it's made in one location, which is very fragile. It's very, right now we're seeing that with, with what's going on in the world, that if something's only made in one location, what do you do when they can't make it? Especially if it's something that is, is, um, life-saving and and very much needed like i know uh, supposedly the uh, from the joe rogan podcast all of the um drip bags well i can't think iv bags are made in the dominican republic and so if there was something that wiped it out there's nothing like there's nowhere else that makes them and i don't know that was again was just on the joe rogan podcast where he had the doctor on talking about the pandemic and that is basically what i have to say about transportation right now and so now we can switch on to the next piece if, or we, if anyone else has anything to add for this one, which is what is currently going on. Well, I think, I think one of the um, things we need to um, specify is what it is that we're transporting. We're, we're living in the age of information. And uh, I'm, I happen to be an educator. So one of the things I'm really interested in is it, it, when do we need to transport people? And when can we transport bits? Because so much of what we do is information. And so we're having a meeting here and we're transporting bits. We didn't have to transport the people. And 
we're spread all over the place. I don't know where you are, Jubilee, now visiting your family, but I'm in Northern California and Richie, you're in Melbourne, Australia. Melbourne, Australia. Um, and we can have a very successful meeting without transporting people. On the other hand, there are huge numbers of things that can't be done without physical transportation of material things, whether they are live things or inanimate objects. So in some senses to, to really address this question of transportation, um, it's, I think it's important to ask the question, could this be done with the transportation of bits? Are we, are we talking about transporting something that's basically informational? Is mm -hmm. Transporting something that's physical you know, and you can't hug each other um, if you don't transport the people. But on the other hand, at this point, we're supposed to be isolating. So <laughs> this is the best we can do. But in yeah. education, it's, it's really important because um, we're now faced with some practical issues about online education where we're not physically transporting the books, the papers, or the people. We're doing it all digitally. This could be a permanent, um, you know, way of, of being for humans now because that they reckon that you know they're not going to get past like we there is a potential that we might not get past this particular virus so um there's a chance that we're always going to have to make sure that we have some level of social distancing and ramp it up um you know when when necessary so that we uh you know it doesn't spread again which is just a terrifying situation because although this is a really good form of communication it's not being in person, face to face, being able to hug one another, being in, in one another's presence. So, you know, this could be a, a very big shift, but it's not really about transportation. Well, it's hard to not have a conversation these days that doesn't bring the pandemic and coronavirus in it. It's our new world. So, yeah, well, well yeah, well, I mean, yeah, brings up a lot of questions. But how and, do we? I mean, in transportation, that is another piece that is big, is our global movement of people brings with it the risk of pandemic that people can be in China one day and in California the next day and in Paris the next day because they have a jet setting lifestyle causes this. And so if we're able to have a world where, um, if this is our new normal, people need to isolate for two weeks every time they get off of any flight ever, which means you're gonna really have a higher metric for am I gonna go visit, right? Am I gonna take mm -hmm. two weeks at the end in order to, to make sure everybody's safe and having maybe we don't socially distance and stop hugging each other, but we have smaller knit communities. But again, not transportation. So again, well, it, um, it, it is in this. If you think of the of, of one of the parameters of transportation as to how far you transport something, whether it's a person or a good. Um, if we had local communities where um, we knew that, I mean, let's let's play with your hypothesis that we we continue to have pandemic like infections that we have to limit. Um, one can develop small local communities that are isolated so that you can have the human contact. You can transport very locally, but you don't transport globally without serious precautions. So that's something we might have to reorganize. Um, yeah. And one, one of the other things that comes to mind is also just the like the, the known fragilities or the known things that can cause chaos to disrupt the system. Like we should be, we should be preparing for these in a, well in advance anyway, because we knew pan pandemics were going to be an issue that was going to crop up at some point in time. And you know, the, the the way that we've handled it, you know, as governments and institutions hasn't really been. I mean, I'm sure it's good given the circumstances, but you know, as a society, we're just not aware of it, um, and we haven't sort of like. There's, there's this issue about how to, sorry, I'm kind of derailing this um, a little oh, bit, yeah. but, uh, I, but like my, my general my general point is that, um, you know, systems like transport um, are affected by, you know, these these massive events. And then how can we, like, I, I feel like going local is a great place to go because that way we have more robustness in the face of, oh, shit. I'm going to have to come back and, uh, have, um, Clean up yeah. the coffee spill. No problem. Go do what you need to do, Richie. <laughs> I can drop you out. Just uh, oh, okay, okay, that's better. That way he can um, he can do what he he'll needs. He'll come to back do. on camera when he opens <laughs> back up, so we can continue on without him. So we can shift into the next piece, which is what does your? They don't need to match. We don't need to okay. democratically agree on our vision of the future. But what is your perfect world look like for transportation? 
five, 10, 100 years out, however long you need it to be out in order for it to be possible in your mind? From my perspective, again, the, the parameters are really important. What you're transporting um, and uh, how far you're transporting it. So I've already made two points. One is we should be looking at when we can do transport, transport digitally, when we can use our digital platforms to um, more carefully deal with the physical transportation problem. And Uber and Lyft are good examples of new ways of handling transportation. Um, and um, so ideally we would use all the tools that we have developed in the last hmm, 20 years um, to manage our transportation systems better. And we would also understand um, the, um, the value of um, functioning locally. It's almost like we've been in thrall of the, the potential of global travel. And so we've been experimenting for a couple hundred years with all the things we can do with global travel. And now that we've explored that and we know that we can do lots of very exciting, wonderful things with global travel, now we're in a kind of evaluative phase. So I see the future as us really looking at the actions that our modern technologies have enabled and deciding which ones we want to use and how we want to use them. What are, I mean, we're, we're looking at one of the negative consequences of this wonderful global travel. Um, and we don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater by throwing out all of global travel, but um, a lot of careful thought needs to go into when do we need to manufacture locally? When do we need, and, and therefore transport locally? When do we need to, um, uh, what's the carbon footprint of transporting? Um, so that's the, the global warming is one negative cons consequence of, of having exploited all the transportation technologies that we have. And, and we really need to sit back and evaluate which ones are worth continuing with and which ones are worth getting rid of. Right, yeah, those are all very good points. Um, my ideal version of transportation in the future, it's weird because hearing you talk, I was like, right, this one piece, I don't know if I want it anymore, which is rapid rail tra tra travel, right? Being able to get from California to New York in a few hours on the ground. I do think it's somewhat more safe because you don't have the recycled air but the speed of it is the problem, but it's also what connects us and what makes it helpful. I don't know if I muted you, Richie, so I'm just going to unmute you because I don't know if you can if I've muted you. <laughs> and um, But having the ability to get somewhere without taking off and landing and possibly having big ships that transport across the, the Atlantic or having massive rail that goes underwater or over water. I don't know what that is, but That's having it. Tunnels. Sorry? Through tunnels through tunnels, yeah, having it be the ability to actually have massive. Uh, what I would like personally is I would like to have access to a car. I would like it to be autonomous. I would like it to drive me somewhere. And I would like to say where I need to get picked up and dropped off. And I don't care if there's somebody else in that car with me, but I wanna be able to get dropped off from point A to point B. Um, also uh, be able to state whether it's um, within, like whether someone's been wearing perfume, whether it has a dog in it, like having, make sure that it's diverse, that there's a vehicle that everyone can use. And then I can get stuff done in the car if I need to. And then also what you had, had stated, Lisa, is a very good point, making sure that whatever can be done in bits is done in bits, that being able to live in a local community is, is part of what I would love to have in the future. And I would like to live there and spend 99% of my time there and except when I go and visit family or family comes and visits me, but I want to be connected to the globe in, in talking. I want to be able to solve problems together and have deep discussions on things that interest me. And if my community doesn't want to talk about the things I want to talk about, I want to be able to find people around the globe. And that's the kind of thing that, that I can do online. And I think that the more we start, I don't know what the word is, propping up, we, we like, you're looked at as affluent and privileged if you're able to travel around the globe, that you've like been to Paris, that you've been to Russia, that you've been to Africa. And if that's no longer the case, and instead it's like, listen, I experienced Paris in VR. I experienced 
walking up Kilimanjaro in this simulation. It's, uh, we don't need to all trace about the globe and I can still feel like I had that experience because it's not about whether or not I'm better than someone else. It's just about, do I feel like I had that experience? Then someone else, like where I would really like to go in person because my grandmother's been there, my sister's been there is Machu Picchu. And so there are some that I would put at a higher level that are like, no, I really want to physically go there. Paris though, where I could like mute the sound and walk through the streets. Thank you, VR would be perfect. <laughs> be able to go to the museums and feel like you're right there in front of it. You have, you know, the whole, the whole Louvre to yourself and you can look around or you can add the people, whatever, whatever makes sense to you. So that is what a bit of my, oh, and one more thing, which was that when we own cars together, they're designed to be, to last where like you, the engine's easy to be put in and taken out if it's an engine, I just said electric cars, but like that, that type of where they're designed to last and the components to be replaced is my version of an ideal future I would like to, to live in. How about you, Richie? Welcome back. Yeah, I'd, I'd be in favor of that. Like, I think transportation isn't really an issue if, you know, we don't have too much transportation on the road and it's not um, like the way that we power it isn't negative to our environment. So if we've got electric cars that are powered on um, fusion uh, reactors, like like not fusion reactions within the car, but like, you know, it's not fossil fuels that we're burning in order to fuel, uh, power that thing, then, you know, we, we can have as much transportation as we like. And, uh, you know, if we can recycle old vehicles and turn them into new vehicles if that if there's a way to do that economically then we should do that but i mean really this for me this always just comes back down to um things need to change like on the individual level and the community level like we just need need a different philosophy of how we're going to organize ourselves within society because you know just you know manufacturing new cars and having to have like the um uh like having to be able to sell you know a million cars in order to, to to prototype the next car and like those kinds of things like it's just such a waste like it's so much so much resources that we're just throwing away and maybe we can do it over you know 300 400 years but like what is what is the resource cycle for all of those components um like like fossil fuel the the resource cycle is so long so you, you can't really um, you know, use use that stuff and then reuse it again in, you know, 50 years or something. It takes a long time to be for that to be reusable. So, yeah, many things to change. But, yeah, electric cars, shared electric cars with, like, you know, um, uh, specific, um, you know, scents and um, spaces and those, those kinds of things. That sounds great. And le le the less people who are stuck in traffic for, you know, X amount of time in their lives, the better, because that's just, you know, really detrimental to people, I think. Yeah. I think like if life looked like it looks now, where people are living in suburbs and driving into the city, being able to connect cars together where they were able to be more efficient and then, you know, and they communicate with each other. So they knew where one was getting off so it could be faster. But also I don't want to live in a suburb and drive into the city. I want to live in my community. I want to like, work online with people around the world and I want to play music and eat and connect and you know raise our kids with a small community that we walk in maybe bike you know like that, that that's even doable and be surrounded by nature and spend most of my time in that community in the surrounding area is what I would prefer but other people prefer to live in the city and I want people to have diversity well that's what I've had the privilege of doing so come come to northern California <laughs> Actually, no, it won't. It won't yeah. be rural if too many people come. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to just mention an invention that I worked on a couple of years ago, several years ago now, but which was I got through the idea stage. We never built a prototype, but it would be a personal transportation pod, which would be like the interior of a small car, a two or two person car, um, which is what you owned, and then you could attach that to what's called a truck, which is like the, the wheels, the, the, the bottom, um, that it could either go into an in, onto an individual car or it could go onto a train or it could go onto an air vehicle or it could go onto a boat so that um, you didn't, it, it was not a single purpose uh, transportation vehicle and it should be um, comfortable enough so that um, you might want to use it for your office as well. And so that, that kind of piggybacks on your idea of, well, they should attach together because you could put it on um, a connected 
train that runs on the road as compared with a train that runs on a track, but you could do either if you had the, the transportation pod. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if anybody's working on that or not, but it's an idea that I'm perfectly willing to throw out into the universe and see if anybody else yeah. wants to do it too. That's a cool idea. I like it. Um, I like the idea of connecting. I also wanted to bring up, although it's not directly related to transportation, is related to not transporting goods. Uh, James Jones's project Cube Spawn of having a um, locally sourced way to manufacture basically anything where the where it's like a Lego fact. It's like a Lego factory. Like the factory itself is Lego, where you can put these pieces together and have it work through and be able to move around and create different things for different people. It's like a 3D printer, but much, much more complex. And I think having one of those in every community so that you can print it there and manufacture it there and manufacture it in the quantity you want and need, as opposed to having it be be shipped. And then we can have some things that don't make sense to be made that way, made more um, redundant so that you aren't having that, that fragility but have, you know, at least two factories in the world making it, but have it shipped when for things that are, that makes sense to do so. Mm -hmm. That's kind of like every, every community needs its own maker space, which has um, industrials um, quality tools that anybody can use so that you can do that local manufacturing. I mean, our libraries are beginning here in California to be turned into maker spaces as well. So we not only have books that can be borrowed, but also welders that can be borrowed and an auto shop that can be borrowed and um, a surge sewing machine that can be borrowed. Yeah, nice. And even for those, like um, we have tool libraries in Vancouver. I don't know if there's one here in Edmonton, but having the barrier of not having your own personal vehicle, having it be able to be delivered, having that you can get a sewing machine and have it dropped off to you and picked up to you. And the more we're able, I worked on this um, thing in my head called the hub, I was calling it, where every person, it was like an alternative to Amazon, where you could bake cookies in your house and sell them or, you know, jam or crafts of any kind. And every, every, every day or every, once a week, depending on the threshold of people, you had um, a pickup and a drop off. So whatever you made was picked up and given to it, brought back to the hub and then dispersed to the, to the customers uh, or other members. I don't like the word customers. And then... It, you got a delivery and a pickup is, is the point. So you could, it was a lot easier if you had an invention, you didn't have to figure out how to get it to the person. And things like um, tool libraries and goods libraries could also be used in that way. Where, hey, my friend has a book across town instead of me needing to go pick it up. I just know she'll put it in her next delivery and it will make it to me. Again, this is sort of a supply chain management, um, which is what's behind transportation and then since you mentioned baking cookies at home the, another issue that has to be dealt with is all the regulation which is although it's not transportation in the sense that it's not a car or a train or a truck or an airplane it is we do have to when we discuss transportation we have to look at all of the regulations that make it possible to, to transport and have everybody participate um in in a coordinated system so along with the discussion about the transportation of, of people and and material things mm -hmm. to talk about the regulations around that and how to govern it yeah Which absolutely you're allowed to sell the cookies that you um <laughs> baked in your own kitchen yeah and there you would leave allowed to give them away right like mm -hmm. if it's just i'm going to bake them and i'm who wants them and then I'm giving them away is that different regulations. And if we want to bake mass amounts of cookies, do we need a commercial kitchen? And then how do we coordinate that? And so, well, that's not transportation, as you said, it is the system that's going to be using the transportation and how efficiently we can do, we can do all of it via consumer, whatever that word is in a better world and a, um, a maker, a maker and a user, right. Of, of various, various goods and services. And that, like, although that's not transportation, being able to have like a hairdresser come to your community as opposed to everyone going out to the hairdresser, having, um, I mean, if you're in a 300 person community, you probably have a hairdresser there, but having 
uh, a massage therapist come out, having someone come out that is they're traveling to you one time and they're, it's much more efficient for them because they're seeing one person after another, clearly not during this time period. And then, um, yeah, that transporting one person as opposed to a bunch of people, it's not bits, but it's more efficient. Mm -hmm. We have probably haven't. Okay. So we're at the 30 minute mark. So now we get to, uh, transfer over to the other, unless someone has closing statements, which let's ask that first. Does anybody have any closing statements for a world they would like to create? It's contingent on a lot of different things. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But now we're gonna get to the like tangent, the adjacent possible. So now we're gonna talk about what could we do with 10,000 people and $100,000. So that could either be a global 10,000 people so something like an app, or I don't know what that would look like for transportation, or it could be a local 10,000, right? 10,000 in Vancouver, 10,000 in Northern California, 10,000 in Sydney. I think you're in Melbourne, actually, aren't you? 10,000 in Melbourne, like having, an, but just that metric, because that's a, that's a doable thing. It's <laughs> something that, you know what I mean, isn't let's redesign our entire transportation system. What could we actually do with 10,000 people and $100,000? Well, we certainly have the example of um, the rideshare services. And, and in a lot of senses, we not only are talking about the transportation of goods, we're also talking about the transportation of services. So moving, and this has been going on for 30, 40 years, is, is trying to conceptualize, to think about um, what used to be thought of as a product, a physical product that got sold as a service that's being sold. And of course the paradigmatic uh, example is flooring, is carpeting services. So instead of selling carpets, you sell carpeting services and the company that sells them handles the transportation, the, in, the manufacturer, the transportation, the, the installation and the removal and end of product life recycling. So they've, they've sold us the service of carpeting rather than the carpet. And you could think about that in terms of hairdressing. You could think about that in terms of taxi service, which has always been a service, but you can think of the taxi or you can think of the taxi service. Um, so in, in some senses, it's specifically in transportation, that experiment's been done with Uber and Lyft and the other ride sharing services. Um, and now you've talked about the hub concept of doing that with, with home produced services going to a hub and coming back. And those are all things you can do thing. You can do lots and lots of stuff with, with the, at the scale that you're talking about, which is, you said 10,000 people in a hundred thousand. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, there are tons of possibilities and that's why we're doing this process. It's not just to pick one. It's to kind of just generate all of the possibilities we could do with transportation. And then when our next step, when we figured this out a while, then we can pick one and actually make it together find 10,000 people each put in 10 bucks and actually make it. Mm -hmm. But right now it's, yeah. Cause I think that creating a cooperatively owned Uber or Lyft where the drivers are looked after. Um, and as the user, we can problem solve together to make it more efficient. So I can't afford Lyft and Uber, but I might be able to car crowd to share a car with Lyft and Uber, right? If I'm coming home from a concert, instead of it being surge pricing, be like, okay, well, if we're able to be connected on an app, then it could say, hey, four of us are going home together. Mm -hmm. And so it's going to be one third of the price. The driver's going to make more, but we're all going to pay less. Again, clearly not in this climate, but like those kind of solutions when we figured out the pandemic. So not only do you have to have the platform for the contacting the driver and getting the driver to the customer, but the customer cohort has to be able to get in touch with each other so that if I'm at the San Francisco Symphony and I need a ride back to Santa Rosa, California, um, I can find if I can query the crowd at the symphony and find out if there's anybody else that wants to go back to Santa Rosa. And and as you said, and then we could ride share together. It's mm -hmm. hard to find each other. Right. I was envisioning more that it would be behind the scenes. Hey, by the way, uh, Lisa, we know that you have a neighbor going there. Would you be OK riding with them? Mm -hmm. And you would say yes or no. And they would say yes or no. And if you both said yes, you'd get matched up. 
Well, there actually yeah. are places in San Francisco that are carpool stops. And you can go and stand at the carpool stop and see if anybody stops by who's going close to where you need to go. Um, I, haven't, I haven't used one, but it seemed like I, I thought it was a good enough idea, so I took mm -hmm. it the sign. Like Which is potentially, it topic. sounds like um, hitchhiking, right? Which is like illegal everywhere, but like because it's car shared and there's a spot, it's more, there's a safety feature to that, but there's a safety we can build into an app more easily. It's not 100%, of course, but something that could be, how do I trust you, either, whether you're the driver or the passenger? How do we share in gas? How do I know that you might get me to point B, but I need to get to point C? Is there someone else going there afterwards, right? And so being able to coordinate basically hitchhiking along mm -hmm. uh, in Canada, our Greyhound, our um, buses quit. They no longer, and not because of the coronavirus, they quit like over a year ago because they couldn't get to little places. And so only the big, um, like out East is still, it's still operating between Toronto and Ottawa and, and Montreal, but not out here. I couldn't even make it home from here if the planes got grounded because there's no mm -hmm. bus between, I'm sure there is actually a bus, but there isn't the Greyhound. It isn't the one that was there. Uh, but these these other ride sharing apps could could take the place, and then also in cities more like Uber and Lyft, where we're also looking after. Um, I don't know if we could do it with a hundred thousand dollars, but finding mechanics who can service the vehicles at cost, right? So that they're a lot of the money that Uber drivers make go to the maintenance of their vehicles. Having gas be made more cheap, maybe they don't have as many. Um, taxes because we're, we're card sharing and doing those things. But again, I don't know if that's doable for $100,000. So for 10,000 people and $100,000 car sharing and an app for car sharing, we couldn't create. Well, these are, these are all experiments that can be tried. And there um, is um, there's a, a group called Code for America, which actually is a bunch of uh, techies who are willing to write apps for free. So you probably could do it for $100,000 if you use Code for America, a local Code for America group. But there's an awful lot that we could do if, essentially we have a huge amount of leisure time. We've been spent the last 500 years developing uh, labor saving devices and they do save a lot of labor. We don't have to scrub our front door stoops anymore. We can just vacuum them off and they're pretty clean. Um, we have huge amounts of leisure time. What we haven't figured out is how to share it. And so part of what we're talking about, well, well ostensibly we're talking about transportation, we're talking about the sharing of transportation. Um, and that's how you get to do, to service 10,000 people for much less money than if you had to buy every piece of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's funny you saying that uh, um, hitchhiking is illegal because that's like the, the standard in New Zealand. That's that's how everyone gets around. <laughs> we just hitchhike everywhere. <laughs> just perfect. It's kind of weird that it's illegal because it's there's much more unsafe things than hitchhiking. And at the same time, it's unsafe. You don't know the person. But a lot of when we design apps together, we design technology together. I think that's something we can discuss and implement safety that isn't creepy. Right. That isn't necessarily like Uber telling you whether you're a good person or not a good person. <laughs> and then you sue Uber if the person's not good. Right. It's like, how do I know that I'm safe? Maybe I just request female drivers and I only ride with people that are female because that's a little bit safer or someone who has a long track record. But having that 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 piece built into it, which, again, isn't quite transportation, but it's needed for transportation. Well, it's also um, somewhat a consequence of the change in transportation, because as I look at the three of us, um, I'm two generations older than you guys, and hitchhiking was legal, legal and was normal. I grew up in Massachusetts um, when I was a kid, and everybody did it. Um, it was a much safer society. However, it was also a society where there was less transportation available and so not only was it harder for the good guys to get around, it was harder for the bad guys to get around. Um, and again, there, were, there, there are positive and negatives to the increase of transportation of people. Um, and our, our ability to move around has in some ways 
um, made the boundaries of our individual communities so much more open and flexible that we don't feel safe in the same way. We don't protect each other. I mean, we never, we didn't even take the keys out of our cars when I was a kid and we never locked the door. That was unheard of. And your friends would walk in and say, hello, anybody there? Uh, but the idea of locking the door was, was strange. So um, I don't know if it's, in a sense, that's not, that's not transportation and yet it's a consequence of a lot of the change in transportation. Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the things we could do with 10,000 people and $100,000 is um, map at least a part of our supply chain is like, where did this pen come from? <laughs> where did, maybe I will never know that, but if I can break down that there's aluminum in it, what, how much, where is aluminum made in the world, right? Maybe it doesn't know where the aluminum in this pen came from, but it can average all the aluminum that's made and where it was made. And here's the transportation for it. Cause it's, it's math plus data if we have it. And mm -hmm. then from there, we can have a lot more power in our supply chain. We can see the fragility of it um, on the transportation of good. And we can see where, well, would it make sense to produce pens locally? They're how much cheap, they probably wouldn't be cheaper but what level would we need to make them at for them to be cheaper? Because they should be, if it's not using a lot of labor, for them to be made locally versus made somewhere else and shipped here. I imagine that data is out there already. Um, that kind of goes back to the, um, you know, how many slaves work for you? Uh, because eventually those supply chains generally lead to, you know, horrible conditions. But <laughs> yeah, enough is a, an easy way to do things. Because I, yeah, I think uh, like different materials cluster in different parts of the world um, unevenly. But. Well, and also if you if you make a commitment to local manufacture, you may also make a commitment to uh, changing the materials that you're using so that you're using local materials. I mean, we could use um, goose quills. We've got we got plenty of turkeys here and plenty of <laughs> large turkey feathers. Um, while turkeys are taking over. <laughs> um, and there used to be a pencil factory right down the street. It might be that we would use pencils rather than, than ballpoint ink pens more if we had a commitment to local manufacture. So it, it, things are all connected together. Not if, if you change one thing, if you, if you set up a principle that says, we don't want to transport things as much, you'll find new technologies and new products made from different, um, you know, we'll eat more local eggs and chickens and less uh, lot beef. Uh, and then I think much, much of this changes if we start pricing and exter externalities, because like the price of, you know, what someone should be making um, for whatever job that is that they're doing and then the cost of the transportation to get from, you know, one side of the world to the other, like we should be pricing the stuff in so that it, we don't have to create the illusion that it's cheaper to make things elsewhere. Cause that's kind of like, that's how it works in our current economic model, but that's not how it works in terms of like the, the price of, you know, destroying the environment or whatever it is or eroding communities or taking away opportunities for people in a local area. I don't think we could get rid of externalities with 10,000 people, a hundred thousand dollars. So it might no, be able no, no, to no, create no. a system that, um, shows you the externalities right so yeah. although i paid two bucks for this pen it should have been 20 right mm -hmm. and so i at least know that if i want to and look it up yeah. um and and knowing right that like okay you bought the eggs that were 50 percent less but the health care and the chicken's life and all this stuff on top of it is and you can even see it broken down that might be something that we could do for a hundred thousand dollars so that the ten thousand people have access to their top goods right their most of the food they buy, most of the clothes they buy, most of the makeup and household goods. What is the externality? Or just how do we make it better? How do we? Well, do you guys have go local initiatives in your communities? We, we do yeah. in Sonoma County, California. There's a, the, I, I think it's the supervisors. I'm not sure who it is who's done it or the Chambers of Commerce have a whole campaign which is called Go Local. And, um, companies, local companies advertised that this product was produced locally and many stores give a discount 
if you buy the local product. So it's a it's a combination of the, the actual economics of it and the kind of ethics of it, and um, you know it costs something to do the campaign, but um, part of the go local initiative is to, um, as you said, bring bring to attention the travel the transportation costs of the goods, and the go local buy local um, really addresses that. Now I suspect that more than $10,000 was invested in it, but it might not have been more than $10,000 a year. Um, yeah, I mentioned like 80,000 of that um, 100,000 would just be advertising. <laughs> if what you're doing is a campaign, yes. <laughs> if, you're, if your objective is to raise people's awareness and change their behavior because they've <laughs> got different information, yeah, that's advertising or information dissemination yeah and then maybe there's like a better way to do things because if we if we started local communities um maybe the focus of those local communities would be more on like what is the system that you're actually embedded in and like what are the things that are going around that are actually pushing things towards um you know better solutions better organization those kinds of things um so people don't have to spend crazy amounts of money on advertising and that just you know, people are just aware of it because it's part of the local community. I mean, it's, again, it's kind of different, but I think like all of the stuff, I feel like we just need a different approach um, on other levels. Like if we solve problems at a, at a lower level, then we can like these things just become easier to solve. But yeah. I think Please. one of the, although again, it's not transportation itself, but it's transportation adjacent is picking an industry like clothing that is definitely made somewhere else and the stuff's brought, brought somewhere and made and then shipped of like, how can we uh, design clothing swaps to be more easy or shared closets so that if I'm going to a special event, I can borrow somebody else's and we can exchange them or having a tool library, even if you're not in a big city center, anyone, and I know these things already exist, but if they exist, when we create them together, they're much more useful. Of um, Like you have a power drill I can borrow as opposed to it needing to be in a central database that I can borrow it from, that I can just borrow it directly from you and it, it helps us figure out where the stuff is so that it doesn't need to be transported, but it could maybe be transported with the hub. Like I think a hub could be set up in a, in a, in a city for $100,000 by finding a bunch of um, local businesses that do want their goods to be to be um, delivered and already have them under the regulations and then figuring out how do we work together to get them to your customer for as cheap as possible, as ethically as possible. And then other people can come on board as they have goods and services and have one one hub location. It probably couldn't be started for hundred thousand dollars in Vancouver, but a more rural place it could be. Less expensive places need to be rural. So, is there a difference between that and um, setting up a a barter system? I mean, in a sense, a barter system. If, if you set up a barter exchange platform and give everybody five hundred or a thousand dollars credit to to prime that pump and then everybody lists the services that they have to offer or the products that they have to offer um and then you just press the go button and let it let it run i mean that we could certainly do with a hundred thousand dollars you could probably do that with ten thousand dollars <laughs> yeah i mean that i'd Sure, it is different than the barter system, but that also sounds like a viable, a very amazing option to have on the table for creating a um, a barter of goods and services that then you don't have to transport and you're not having all of the, the bureaucracy involved in everything everything you do together. Or, I don't know what I was going to say. It's just, I think just doing it for free, right? Like I said about the cookies, like here's what here's what I'm giving. I'm giving it to the, to the world who needs it the most and having multiple options, people who need to make money and people who see which one, which one plays out, which one calls the most people in. Hmm. I suppose you could also have an app where you have like, so someone's at their house and they're like, oh, I need a, um, you know, a toaster or something like that. And they press kind of the thing and then they send out a ping sort of like how the ride share apps work. And then if someone's traveling, you know, past them, 
at some point they could be like, oh, well, I don't, I'm not using my toaster at the moment. I'm going to be leaving in five minutes. So you can like, you know, I, I guess the problem with that is just the attention economy because you're going to have to somehow get people's attention. People are going to have to put this thing on and like what's mm -hmm. their incentive to do that? Probably none. But I just think sure. there was this um, Facebook group called Moms to Moms that I was part of and it was like you'd put something up for free. It was always for free. It'd be like, I have a guitar and then there'd be a bunch of people and if you could have a either first come first serve or you could do like a lottery system. And I was disappointed because I gave my guitar to it. And then later on, I was like, wait, I actually want my guitar. And, it could, and so you were allowed to say what you wanted. And if it was something that came up, then you were the first to get it. And it was the only thing I put, I was like, I want a guitar. And someone came up with a guitar and they were like, oh, Jubilee wants a guitar. They were like, no, no, you can't want a guitar. It's not like a, a, a needed item. So we're going to auction it. And it was like, that's not... And so having something like that system, but when you gave something, you were just as likely to get that same thing back. So I didn't need to hold on to it, right? Like if I gave a guitar, I would get a guitar later if I wanted one. And then you'd be more willing to give it up, right? Be like, if I want this book back, not necessarily this one, but like any one of that book, then I'll get it if I want it. So I can be more willing to give it out so that it's lent everywhere. And it just, it just keeps what I've given into the system so that I, again, if I want a guitar back, I can get a guitar back. Is that the difference between a donating system and a lending system? If you if if you wanted a guitar and somebody and you could lend your guitar, then yeah. the recipient could keep it until you wanted it back, and then yeah. they had to give it back. But yeah, if it's or it a could motion circulate. system, you can't get it back. Yeah, yeah. So you could set it. You could set up the platform so that you could specify whether it was a loan or a donation. Mm -hmm. Um. It's just another bit in the database. Yeah. With with a toaster, there's some issue because it's a there's a hygiene issue around mm -hmm. whether you get your toaster back clean or filled with somebody else's crumbs. Um, so in current lending li lending tool lending library kinds of things, often you have to put a cleaning deposit down mm -hmm. um, so that if you don't give it back clean, it can be Somebody gets paid to it. But that's, that's that's a little hurdle that could be solved as compared with the, the basic idea. Yeah. And plus things, because I'm not the cleanest person. So like, I want someone to know that when they're lending me something, I will try, I will clean it, but it probably won't come back pristine. Whereas other people I know, they'll probably come back better than you lent it to them. Because mm -hmm. they're just the kind of people who know how to get every mark off of stuff. Um, but having that, right? Not a rating, like you're not going to give it to me because I'm still going to look after it to the best of my ability. Or if you have a cat or a dog and then you're allergic, maybe you don't lend it to somebody with, with that. Just having more information in the system so you can be more focused on it. And if everything I borrow breaks, you know, maybe I stop borrowing stuff. Like you see who who is the person who doesn't clean stuff or breaks stuff and, and maybe they, you know, to know the risk associated with lending a specific person something. Yeah. Well, the, the thing is, the, the more... The more bad actors there are in a system, the less likely people are to continue to use them. So, mm -hmm. yeah. But that's like, I'm not a bad actor. Like, I don't think I'm a bad actor. But like, if to just have that information, right? Like, okay, you, you're going to forget you have it and forget to give it back, right? Like, we're all different human beings with our own failings. So just knowing if this is the high, because everyone can't be perfect. In fact, nobody's perfect. So we all probably have things that we don't do. But knowing what thing you don't do that is going to annoy me at my highest level. So I don't gift it to like, I don't lend it to that person. Maybe I only gift it to that person, right? So that I know it's okay, I'm never going to get it back. It's never going to be in, the, in that stage. It's like friends I have who I know are late all the time, but I know they're late all the time. So I give that that extra that extra time and send it back half an hour. Well, I, think I don't what, think they're bad people. As, as these platforms get designed, we have to, there's, it's an iterative process where you design it and you try it out and this problem comes up. We can anticipate a couple of the problems, but we probably can't anticipate them all. We have to try it out. And part of, I think, being successful is a matter of being flexible. And whether it's, we just, we just in Sonoma County, California, started the smart train, which is a, um, a light rail that goes doesn't go all the way to San Francisco, but it goes close. Um, 
and some of the some of the features that were implemented were are successful and some of them are not and there there was just in, in the primary we just had to vote on whether to continue to fund the smart train and a lot of people were saying well it didn't meet their expectations so therefore we shouldn't um, keep it going and other people are saying hey this is a continuous approved project and we need to keep funding it and it will get better. Um, so thinking that the, our first answer is the definitive answer in anything, but trans, certainly in transportation is probably not going to evolve a very successful trans, transportation system over time or barter system, like, or lending yeah. system. And I think that's an important part of anything we create is that it doesn't need to be perfect. It starts somewhere and then it, it, it improves and gets better as you um, have more people. I mean, the idea also of having 10,000 people creating a solution is that hopefully they have some ownership over that solution. So they're more likely to accept slightly subpar and they're more likely to give their contribution, both idea and financial to help improve it because they feel ownership over it. So that is very much in alignment with, I think anything we create together is what's the, easiest thing or the simplest or the the best, the thing that's going to have the most impact for the least amount of money that we can create. And then how do we look for what's going wrong and continually improve it to their maximum benefit? Does anyone have anything else they would like to add? We're getting up to the hour, so we can give our closing statements. Nothing, that was good. Well, I'm just, go ahead. I'm just delighted to participate because I this, this is my first time to find out about this activity and I'd love to be involved with further um, solution rising meetings. Yeah, absolutely. I would love to have you again, Lisa. It was great meeting you. And so we can say goodbye to the online world and then we can go off world and chat a bit. So thank you everyone who was here and tuned in or people watching this on replay.